So uh, welcome to this week's Visiting Speaker. I'm going to let Roger do the introduction. Roger works on the architecture course and you take care of the theory mainly, don't you? Is that, is that correct? Yeah. 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 I'm not misrepresenting people. Um, so I'll let Roger do the introductions for this week. Um, there isn't a talk next week because it's reading week, but there is one the week after, uh, the first week we come back, and it's going to be Dave Lee, uh, director, writer, journalist. So that'll be the first talk in the first week back. Thanks, Steve. Um, right, I'm just going to say a few words of introduction and then let uh, Samita do most of the, the talking. Um, I'm really pleased to have Samita here today because I think you'll find that she'll give you a very, very different perspective on all sorts of things to do with architecture than uh, you may have come across up until now. Um, we've been working together for quite a few years on little bits of architectural work. Um, um, I did a few things when Samita was running the MA course at uh, London Metropolitan University called Architecture for Rapid Change and Scarce Resources, which I'm sure you'll talk a little bit more about. And more recently with um, the charity that Samita set up called Charashila, which again we'll, we'll hear more about. Uh, and all of these things together um, add up to, as I said, a, a very different perspective on architecture than you'll get from most of the profession. Um, but it's worth pointing out that you may, get, you may get the feeling, rather like me, who have never joined the RIBA and have always sat on the fringes of the profession, that Samita is the same, but quite the contrary, Samita is actually on RIBA Council. So she's chosen the path of changing the profession from within, where I've <laughs> opted to sit on the outside and uh, complain about it. So I'm going to let Samita do all the talking from now on, and I'm very glad to be able to welcome her here today. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Roger. I'm, I'm Sumita Sinha. And um, am I am I all right? And um, I'm very very pleased to be in Hull because I've never been um, to Hull before in my life. So I'm very happy to be here and to see you all. Um, as as Roger said, I've got a sort of very interesting and varied career so far. I've um, practiced as an architect in various countries and also in the UK. I studied architecture the part uh, one and two in New Delhi. Then I did my part three at South Bank. I have a degree in environmental design from Cambridge University. And um, I worked as a self-employed architect. I've also worked as an employee. Um, I've written a lot, including the leaflet about the book I've just given you. And I have... Um, been involved with the RIBA since 1998, and I was first chair of Women in Architecture, and then I set up um, Architects for Change, which is the Equality Forum at the RIBA, and we've been looking at equality issues there. I'm now on the council. I was in the practice committee, professional practice committee. I'm also in the disciplinary committee, so any architect who has done any wrong <laughs> Um, needs to be disciplined, those appraisals are sent to me. So I have some very interesting case studies of what you shouldn't do if you're a practicing architect. And some of these are very obvious and you think people wouldn't do this, you know, when they're in their 50s or 60s and been practicing architecture for so long. But you'll be amazed at the sort of things people do, very simple elementary mistakes. Um, I'm now in the International Committee, which uh, has been an interesting experience. Um, and also, as part of my varied career, I am a non-executive director of uh, Moorfields Eye Foundation Trust, so I'm part of the NHS as well. So looking into good hospital design at the moment. So I, I suppose this um, kind of shows that architects can have um, a very general and varied career. If you're an architect, you're actually very lucky. Um, you know, you can choose what you want. You can write books. You can, you know, advise on hospitals, um, on healthcare, as I've done. 
equality issues teach, as I've done for 17 years or so. So I, I think architecture, studying architecture is a great privilege and a great honor. So I'm very, very pleased to have studied it. So the way I have worked is that uh, it's provided me a good basis for what I call design activism, activism. And actually, I like to think I'm a creative activist. So uh, because I'm not just practicing design activism, but I'm doing activism in, in several different areas. So th this is the book um, that was published in 2012, and I've given you a leaflet if you're interested in this area. I think the leaflet gives you 20% off, so it's cheaper than buying on Amazon. But um, I got interested in architecture as a sort of a general um, subject a long time ago because I began to see that practicing architecture wasn't such a sort of watertight thing. It actually was influenced by a lot of things that were happening around us, as well as influencing. We, we were in a position to influence things that uh, were, you know, for, for the better or for, for the worse. And, um, you know, for instance, um, NHS is in a pretty bad state at the moment, and I'm trying to uh, make people understand that good hospital design uh, saves money and saves lives and contributes to patient experience. So. As an activist, you know, we, we realize that we have a role to play in every part of our lives. And uh, rapid change and scarce resources, uh, the phrase comes from the fact that the world around us is rapidly changing. I mean, who would have thought, just even a few months ago, that people in Somerset would have found themselves in the same position as people in Bangladesh? So, um, you know, the huge climatic, uh, climate change coming across. We're also in, um, you know, uh, scarce resources everywhere, whether we're in UK or in Bangladesh. You know, um, apparently I read in the papers today, David Cameron has assured people there that no stone would be left unturned and, you know, billions of pounds of money will be set aside to help the people. When I thought, well, you could have done that to prevent that you know, happening, the loss of lives and the inconvenience and the damage to buildings and streets that have happened so far in the last few months, that, may, that could have been prevented if we had thought more about climate change and the effect it was going to hap have on us, because these things had been predicted a long time ago. So, um, and, and I don't know whether these promises, you know, all these promises that politicians make, I'm never sure. You know, I know we, we live in the world of scarce resources. I know that every department in the government, um, everywhere, they're cutting down. So I don't know how he can say we're just going to have unlimited resources to help the people in that part of the world. So, um, and the, the, the thing is, people were, again, in the papers today, people were saying, uh, well, in, uh, well, the UK is giving billions of pounds to other overseas countries. Why is it doing that? Because we've got a disaster in our own country. You know, we should stop giving aid to other countries because we need to put money into this country. So that's, that's an interesting question we can, we can come back to again. Um, so what does it mean to work um, in the area of rapid change and scarce resources? Um, I've just taken the aspect of working internationally. I don't know if you have field trips to go abroad, do you? You do. So have, which, uh, which sort of countries have you visited so far? Uh, Barcelona. Yeah. Barcelona. Yeah. Uh, Holland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Venice. Venice. Yeah. Okay, so quite nice, you know, places to be in, Netherlands. Italy and Spain. So, but a lot of the architects uh, have chosen to work um, also in the sort of aid area. And just a very quick overview of the kind of projects that architects could get involved in and the way aid is given. And there's more description of aid uh, in my book, but just, just to give you an overview, obviously I hope we don't get in, in, involved in the first um, kind of aid, military aid, 
although we hear that some exhibitions, uh, a very prominent design exhibition in London is, is sponsored by the same company that manufactures weapons. So a lot of architects have been protesting against it. So, you know, so you see just architects are not in that little, little world of their own. They're always connected with what's happening outside. Disaster aid, so this is the aspect I was talking about earlier. And um, often um, architects are not involved in such work because um, aid agencies such as Oxfam and Red Cross have um, considered that architecture is a luxury. So they don't like to have architects on board, they like to have engineers. And so architects have sort of gone about making their own little organizations. So you have Architects of Frontier, you have Article 25, you have Architects for Humanity. So they've made up their own kind of organizations to combat this um, lack of work from disaster management um, aid. And this, uh, the third one is a particular one where architects do get involved and this is called development aid and unlike the other the first two it's not like an emergency thing it's a long-term kind of aid and you have different uh, kinds of aids like project aid which is given for a specific project a program aid which runs across several years across a specific program you also have a budget support which is given to governments which haven't got enough money to put a whole um, program together or, and, and support it. You also get what is called sector-wide approaches, which means that you get all these together in one. So you get project aid, program aid, budget support, everything packed into one kind of thing. You also get food aid. Um, and the, the, the last one, which I've put in red, is technical aid. And this is where a lot of architects do get involved in different ways um, here. And then you have different kinds of aids, which are sort of dependent on how the money is being used, whether that's coming from one country or several countries, so it's multi-bilateral aid. And you have untied aid, which is basically unconditional aid. And then you have tied aid, which depends on, you know, they, they tell you the aid's got to be used for this specific purpose. You can't use it for anything else. So um, these are sort of ways that governments, um, you know, it's this top-down approach uh, which has been agreed to giving aid. But there are other ways of working internationally, of, of affecting change in the environment we see, in the situations we see. I consider that we're all citizens and we're all political people and we have views on things and, you know, injustice anywhere probably makes us angry and makes us want to do something, same as any other citizen in the world. And for that reason, and particularly as architects are more sensitive, I consider. Um, so in this world of complexity and scarcity, I've got this sort of um, very basic chart <coughs> to show what could be possible and where the balance lies. So you have your health, and your own health could be your personal health, the sort of community around you, that kind of health, um, and then the global health. And all those three aspects affect your health. And these days we live in a sort of a society which is uh, communicating both physically and virtually with the rest of the world. So we can't say we're not um, connected with the rest of the world. So um, if there is a problem with our personal health that relates to the global um, health, and on, on the other hand, if something happens somewhere in China, like bird flu, it might get transmitted to the UK and affect people here. So the same thing happens with our environment, uh, with the local economy and, and global economy and politics as well. And these four things are actually very sensitively, um, you know, they are... Um, they come together. And when you have this sort of balance between the four aspects, then you get some kind of harmony in society. Otherwise, you have um, this harmony. But it's, it's always like a balancing act. So sometimes you might have a health epidemic going on. And the environment is <coughs> fine. You know, everything else seems to be fine. So I suppose the, the sort of the quarter of the circle that I've shown, the health would be sort of bigger in that area, so we need to focus more on health, whereas environmental issues might be smaller. 
then there might be a time when the economy is, is a big chunk um, and it, it takes over everything. It takes over health and the environment and the politics and people say we have no money left for climate change to tackle climate change because there is no money. And sometimes politics takes over, you know, we have a coalition government, you know, uh, some of them want to do something and other ministers want to do other things and there's always this sort of um, thing going on in between our uh, national politics then global politics. Um, so our role in this very complex world becomes even more complex you know, when we want to perhaps expand and do something for other people. So what I call design activism is a kind of thought about three ways that it's actually, it works. And within those three ways, you have uh, three other ways. So I've got three by three by three. So first of all, <coughs> What is design activism? It's a small action. It's a, a, an action that is indirect. Often that, you know, it could be a direct action, but more often than not, it's an indirect action that sets off something else, and you'll see that in my projects. And um, you also find that it's a collaborative effort, that it's not something you can do by yourself. Design activism involves people and collaboration, which as architects, we know right away, as soon as we start studying architecture, that um, you know, we have to collaborate. We collaborate with the contractor, with the client, with the builder, um, with the quantity surveyor, and so many other people in, in putting this finished building together. So it's always a collaborative process. Um, design activism is creative work that involves beauty, benefit, and good. Now, beauty, benefit, and good was a sort of phrase or the three set of um, value creation that was propounded by a Japanese philosopher called Makiguchi. And he said every action in society must have beauty, um, you know, aesthetic um, part to it. It must have benefit, so it must have material um, and benefit. Also, you know, the building must be robust. The project, um, you know, has to have benefit for the whole community. And it has to be good. So uh, good in the sense of architecture could be defined as being sustainable. So it's um, sustainable financially, environmentally. Um, so these three things is um, sort of what is called creative work. Without these three things, it's, it's not really creative. And design activism is a political act. It is about informing. It's about changing. And it's about improving. And in, in every way that we design, we are always doing that. And if, um, you know, if you feel that you can't do this last thing, then you're, you, know, you might as well not be an architect. You know, there's so many other people doing these sort of um, soulless mass housing. You know, if you want to design something special, if you want to make a statement, then you have to be informing, you have to be changing, and you have to be improving what was already there. So um, Roger didn't say, Roger ha has been uh, one of our trustees in the small charity that I started in 2010. Um, I actually started um, uh, putting aside bits of money uh, when my first son was born. And then I started collecting <coughs> these sort of money from lectures and things that I've done. And, um, and one of the things, because I suppose I had um, you know, young children to think about, was this idea of working with young people and how they relate to the built environment. And um, everywhere we went, we saw um, examples where um, you know, people didn't relate. Uh, obviously, you, you do because you're studying architecture. But most people do not understand architecture. They don't see any need for architects. And as a profession, we are sort of thinking, are we really needed? So a way of engaging um, young people with the environment was one of the things we, uh, we were aiming at when I set up this charity, Charushila. And um, it's also a way of transforming and changing human society because we're looking at the adults of tomorrow. So these were the fundamental ideas that uh, we were interested in. And with that in mind, and this is one of the first projects we did 
And we, we try and involve, um, to have this beauty, benefit and good, uh, for the aspect of beauty, we try and involve an artist or something creative to put that aspect of aesthetics in our, in our work. Um, and we involve the community because we believe that has to be a benefit as well as a long-term sustainability. So, and we involve NGOs and other organizations in different countries. So this is a project in um, Caracas in Venezuela. And um, this was basically this site um, was left over. I don't know if you know this project at all. The architects got an award for this project. It's the Metro Cable project in, in, in Caracas. And people, <coughs> there are the slums you can see in the background here. They're built on very high hills. And someone has calculated that to go from the bottom of the hill to the top, you're having a daily walk of 25 stories. Can you imagine doing that? So 25 floors. You know, you're going up, down. So they, they put these uh, ski car uh, arrangement to go from the top to top. But the result was that some of the areas which were in between didn't get, um, don't have any access at all, so that, that problem still remains. And um, so this um, was a site which um, had some houses, some, you know, shanty have, town sort of houses in there. And these were demolished. So um, in, in Venezuela, everything grows very quickly, so the place turned quite um, green very quickly. So we took these uh, bunch of kids that you see here. So Caracas is quite amazing. It's like this sort of long slither between uh, two mountain ranges. And um, the, the slums and the city kind of jostle each other, you know, they're kind of together. So this is the new um, railway, uh, the metro cable station that was built. And we got these kids to um, do a drawing workshop, ask them ideas about what they thought was possible to do with that space. Because once the houses were demolished, gangs took over. So Venezuela is apparently the world's most violent city, uh, country in the world. And there were gunfights, uh, drug fights, and everything going on in that um, place. So the kids were very frightened, obviously, a lot of them had lost their brothers or sisters, uh, parents, in the sort of gun and the violence. So uh, they came up with several ideas. We then went um, to the local community, showed them to the adults. This is a, a painting I did of the ideas we put together from the work that the kids did. And then the adults kind of discussed it. We also had, we were very lucky to have a psychologist who, were, who was working with us because we were working with a community that is sort of terrified with violence that's around it. So we, it was great that he was there. And then I, based on the sort of rubble we actually found on the site, we, we created these sort of rubble tortillas. So basically rubble wrapped in chicken wire mesh. And then we created structures. Uh, we cleared a lot of the site. We kept a bit aside for a sort of wildlife area and we created planters and divided up the garden using these kind of um, blocks. And we also, at the end, we had a discussion to say what was going right, what was going wrong. And um, this um, project has now been taken forward by the community and they're doing other stuff. And this is the whole idea of indirect change. So you just spark something and the community takes it forward. Um, and do, would the work, idea work in the UK? Yes. We did this work in um, Ealing, in West London, which is a relatively wealthy area of the UK. And again, we started off with the, a community, uh, a kids workshop there, got the ideas. The kids had some fantastic ideas what to do with this space, which was a sort of an orchard. Um, we had local artists involved who showed kids what could be done with the trees and willow we found over there. Um, and then we took the ideas from the workshop to the community, discussed those. We also had awareness raising on environmental issues. And then the kids came up with this idea of a wildlife garden they wanted. They said uh, um, there weren't any wild spaces in London left anymore. Everything was, has been sort of you know, farmed or, you know, civilized or sanitized in, in different ways. So they wanted an absolutely wild space. And just a few weeks ago, I heard that the local council has actually agreed 
to turn this and they you know, paid some more money to the Ealing Transition Group. And this idea is uh, we're going to start work on it in the summer. So again, sparking off something very small within the community, then taking it forward. So we now come to Palestine, which is um, uh, the latest um, project I've done just um, in November I was there. Now Palestine is an interesting um, area, as you probably know. If you can call, uh, if you can talk about rapid change and scarce resources, this has to be it. Uh, well, the other places as well, but for sure this is, um, and it's a political hotbed. Um, so I won't go into the politics of the place, I'm sure you have your own views. I'm going to concentrate on the environmental aspects of this building project. So um, in um, Palestine, this is like 1948, and we come to the last slide. This is sort of thing you can get on the internet. Um, and this is what's happening is a lot of West Bank and uh, Gaza have disappeared. Now, um, setting aside the political implications and the political aspects of that, this has had some really crucial environmental problems because uh, the map in a way is not correct in the sense that the Israeli settlements, they're actually dotted. So the West Bank is still there, but they're kind of dotted. So it's not all white like that but they're at vantage points, so um, you know, in between the West Bank, and you'll, you'll see what I mean, so you'll have a city and right next to it would be a settlement, which has made life difficult. And also people are not allowed to uh, use rainwater, and this is uh, quite, um, quite severe considering that the Israelis at the moment are using 83% of the water resources in this very hot part of the world and the Palestinians, who number more than the Israelis, are using 17% um, only. And then you have the other countries around it. You have like Syria and Lebanon, and all these countries of great political unrest as well, and people are sometimes coming into um, these areas. So, you know, it, it pro it's making a huge um, sort of environmental impact on the, on the area. But um, the water, um, you know, rainwater collection is not allowed. Um, recycling, there are issues to do with recycling. And there are lots of quarries which are run by both Palestinians and Israelis. And these uh, quarry, uh, the quarrying of Palestinian stone is causing a lot of damage to young people's lungs and to the health of the people who live in the villages. The Bedouins are constantly on the move. Um, you know, I, I can just go on, probably do a whole lecture on the, about this situation. But just to kind of introduce to you the environmental aspects. Uh, I worked in uh, Albira municipality, which is twinned with Ramallah. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Ramallah. It's probably the biggest city in West Bank. It's where Yasser Arafat was from, and he's, um, um, he's buried there. So Albire municipality had this space, and when I was shown this space, when I went there, uh, we'd spend about like eight months talking about the project, and things fell through, then you know, other people came into the picture, and, and I was very nervous, but <coughs> I was shocked when I sh was shown this and told this is our site, one of the sites. Actually, they'd chosen four, and I thought it that one looks like that. I wonder what the other three look like. So, and this was an ancient well. And because there are settle there's a settlement, Israeli settlement, very close to this site, which is situated on a hill, uh, what they do is they capture the water on top of the hill. So this ancient well has no water left anymore. So the Palestinians have de uh, decided to just, you know, because people would fall down the well, they just put some concrete cover on it. It's really ugly. But you could see some lovely stone stonework around the area, and you could imagine, you know, what this beautiful well must have looked like sometime. So we had this horrible concrete thing in the middle, which we decided, well, I said, I'm going to plant an olive tree in there. You know, I'm going to put some compost in there, create some compost, and put an olive tree. And people had told me there was uh, some waste. So I said, oh, wonderful, we'll just kind of... Um, use the waste we find, because that's what we'd done in Venezuela. We had used the rubble which we found on site. 
and all our projects have been about using waste and found materials. So I was very, but when I saw the amount of waste there, I was like, you know, what, what can I do with this? It's, it's too much. And also it was contaminated, it was smelling. Someone told me there was a dead dog inside that uh, well. Uh, of course, we, we took everything by hand and some of, it, some of us had gloves, some didn't. It was like an environmental sort of disaster, I felt. So in the end, uh, you know, if you look at those young boys who were helping us, I just didn't want anybody to get ill. So in the end, uh, we pleaded with the municipality and we got one of these. Uh, we had, we had by hand, we had packed about 33 bags of rubbish. And was, it looked like we had done nothing, even when those 33 bags were, rubbish bags were full. And also the other thing was it was full of glass, just full of tiny bits of glass. We, you know, didn't know what, what to do, you know, how to get rid of that. We were raking, sweeping, trying to get rid of the grass because there were kids helping us. So this, um, well... This uh, remind me to tell you what happened with the well, the well story, because I might forget. So we cleared it out and, and put some, we well, trying to put compost in it. And um, initially, the sort of small changes we noticed immediately as the site was cleared. First of all, this is the, I think after three or four days when we managed to clear the site. And this is the first thing that happened there, was the kids just started playing football. All the kids, you know, it was just amazing. They, had, they didn't have a play area at all before that. And someone got a ball and these girls and boys playing it. It was just such a wonderful thing to see. You know, we, we play football here, we watch football, and, you know, it doesn't assume that significance. It did when I saw these kids playing there. It was just beautiful. And the other thing was that the local community were accusing the supermarket, which was next to the site, of putting all that rubbish in the, on the site. And the supermarket man was saying, well, it's not me, it's the community that's dumped the rubbish. So the two of them were like fighting and they didn't, um, the man didn't like it that we were actually building this park or creating this park next to his supermarket. But when he saw this clear space, he actually said, I'm gonna adopt it. You know, I'm gonna make sure it stays clean. And he admitted that he had put some rubbish actually. Uh, but the community in that also admitted that they put some rubbish. So everybody was happy, you know, they'd all contributed to the rubbish and they were all going to keep it clean together. So that was good. So these were the first important changes, very significant changes we saw. Um, as part of the awareness raising that I did in Venezuela and also with um, the Ealing Project and other places was we worked with the workshop or with the kids, the teenagers and small children. So Amadeus is an um, yeah, NGO which is funded by the US and this is specifically for um, teenagers. So I uh, asked the kids to bring back um, from their homes washed plastic um, bottles we can use on the site. And I just, you know, I hardly use plastic uh, personally and I just imagine that they'd all turn up with say at the most 10 bottles each of them turned up with five sacks of um, clean wash bottles. So everything, you know, comes by Israel into Palestine. It's huge amount of embodied energy in those plastic bottles they're drinking. And that wasn't it. I later on inspected an eye hospital where um, there were young children affected with um, eye problems due to having high sugar drinks and this sort of, you know, Coke and uh, Coca-Cola and... Um, Pepsi and all the other things they had. So we, and I, I said, okay, we have got rid of all that contaminated rubbish on site. We're going to use your stuff. So we uh, made things, and I've got some spare ones I brought, which you can have as a sort of souvenir after the lecture. Um, so we made a lot of things to use on site and for them to um, take away home. We also asked for a little um, sort of drawing, asked them to do drawings of what, how they saw sustainable Palestine or how they saw um, you know, uh, their own uh, local community. And these boys are sort of showing um, the issues they think are very important, which included the pollution, uh, the lack of greenery, etc. So that was quite interesting. I also went to Al Amara refugee camp, which um, is the um, uh, it's a it's a refugee camp which was um, 
created when Israel was created in 1948. So all the people had uh, come in, there was dire conditions. And so I did a workshop with the girls there. I did a workshop with um, Birzeit University and also with um, uh, Rivak, which is a conservation body. So, you know, there's just sort of general awareness raising. I think in a country where there's no awareness of um, recycling and the impact, the environmental impact, plus the, uh, you know, if you remember that, that uh, the chart I showed you, you know, anything that affects the environment also affects your health, affects the economy and affects the politics. And this is a perfect example, this plastic bottle. Everything comes by Israel. So, you know, all these plastic bottles come by Israel. They cost a lot of money. Um, you know, they have an impact on the health of the people who are consuming these sugary drinks. So, um, you know, there's, there's all these four aspects which are um, totally inter interconnected. So, um, when doing the project, uh, we, had, uh, we actually decided in the end to abandon the other two and just concentrate on two of the sites because we're running, we had spent so long trying to clear the first site, just we didn't have time to do all four sites. So, at this first site, we had um, you know, spread um, here and there, we had 150 volunteers from five different organizations, including NGOs and schools. And, you know, we had volunteers like this three-year-old girl, and there was another little boy I'll show you, he's my little favorite. He was, after school, he'd come, he'd find us there, he'd throw off his satchel, just get digging straight away. And I thought, my four-year-old never did that, you know, when he was four. But, you know, to have that energy, it's just, it was just wonderful. The kids' energy was, like, really infectious. So we, it was very difficult to organize so many people, you know, it got chaotic, at times, you know, in the UK, we sometimes suffer from the lack of volunteers, and here we, we actually suffered from too many volunteers. So I hadn't thought of that. So this is a new problem we had encountered, and I'm going to have to think creatively about this new problem. But anyway, we kind of managed. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it was interesting because people coming here with their plastic bottles, drinking, you know, those sugary drinks, and I said, well, this is exactly what creating this garden. How can you bring these bottles here? So when I said that there were no bottles, plastic bottles were allowed on site, then the local community started giving us the you know, sage tea, which they drink in um, Palestine. They were making tea for us in proper cups and bringing it to us. Um, so I said, absolutely no plastic cups. And obviously, we didn't want to have glass because there were kids uh, around. So it was like constant, you know, constant kind of thing to keep them going. Okay, so this is one picture of the sort of well, what we did. Um, people painted all sorts of political banners and colors, whatever. And these colors weren't, didn't have any symbolism. We just painted with whatever colors were donated to us, whatever paint was donated to us. Uh, so we made sort of hanging stuff. We created those tire seats. And the other thing was the council was very interested in um, making us plant anything they gave us. And I said, no, just uh, we, we want to encourage biodiversity. So we just took the local plants that would have grown in Palestine and we planted those. And yes, the well. Now what happened was that <laughs> when, you know, you just saw that slide with the whole lot of people in it, the local council kind of dropped in, all of them. And they are like a local council of any place. They had their photographs taken and everything. And then they declared that the well in which we were just about to plant this olive tree was a site of antiquity, and we could not touch it. And I said, well, we've spent days clearing this thing out and putting, layering it with green compost and cardboard to plant this tree. They said, oh, no, we, you, you, can't, you can't do that. So I was, like, really angry about it. Um, so, in the end, what, what has been agreed with the council, and I don't know how or when this is going to happen, is they're going to take off all that concrete, and they've said they're going to revive the well. So I said, that will be interesting, because you actually can't get too much water. But you do get some water. I don't know if you can just see there are some holes within the retaining wall. So when there are floods, when there's, like, the rainy season, water does come. So there's a possibility there is still some water there that uh, you know they could use so and they also put a sign outside saying this is a tourist attraction so this is like has become like a tourist uh, tourist attraction of Alberay municipality 
So this um, is a picture of some of the volunteers. Um, these two, these three are from Albire, as from Vizayat University Environmental Group. Um, and this is my favorite boy. He was um, he was called uh, Mohammed, and he was he was the one that used to come every day. He's four years old, and just boundless energy, and just uh, you know the the. The infectious uh, laughter and his spirit was just, just every time I look at this photo, it kind of reminds me of that. And then, of course, other people, the other companies around us, um, I don't know if you know about West Bank, a lot of bottling industries are centered around West Bank, which are run by Israelis and employs Palestinians. They heard about this project and they came with their plastic bottles. And I said, we were trying to ban plastic. And the reason we used those, the plastic was because these teenagers turned up with the plastic bottles. And we didn't want to chuck them because there's no recycling facilities in Palestine. So, um, so we decided to do something creative with the plastics we had. So we created this canopy that you can see over uh, some of the plants that needed partial shading. And we used some of the plastic bottle tops. So these are all clean plastic bottle tops. Um, uh, as sort of mulch. And this is the other space uh, we were working on, and this has primarily become like a point where bus passengers would collect and teenagers hang out. Previously, they were used to like playing football in that. This is actually like a roundabout, quite busy roundabout, and your kids playing football and running around. So we created this small space Again, using the same things we had. We had so many plastic bottles to get rid of, so we packed the tires also with plastic bottles and cemented, them, uh, cemented it over and then created the seats. And again, we also planted and we cleared a lot of the stuff. We found a lot of Palestinian, um, carved Palestinian stone that had been used to construct those big houses. You know, the uh, middle-class Palestinians do have... Um, you know, big houses, that's the one in the uh, background that you can see. And they had uh, thrown away bits, so we used those bits to create sort of crazy paving and uh, we sort of um, did ornamental things. And the other thing we found that it was very interesting without, I, I came back to the site one day after having worked on the other site and came back to see how this one was doing. And this boy, he's the son of the supermarket owner. And I found him doing that. And he had found these, these trees, which were, very, were going to be thrown by the lo local municipality. And he brought them, and he planted one of them. And then we helped him to create a little sort of thing with plastic bottles. And he was watering them. And he, he said, this is my garden. I'm going to look after it. And I said, yeah, you tell your dad as well that you're going to look after it <laughs> and not throw any rubbish. And we found these girls. They were watering the plants and the herbs that we would planted. And they, we, this was the last sort of get together we had, um, and they presented me very kindly. Got my name wrong, got my profession wrong. <laughs> That's okay. It's a, you know I've been made into an engineer. <laughs> Maybe I sound like one. So um, I was presented with a plaque for my efforts. And uh, what's been happening is uh, since I've left is quite amazing. So this is a painting workshop that was um, uh, done by a local artist. Again, you know get artists involved. We couldn't do that before I, um, when I was there. But these kids are taking part in drawing scenes, uh, you know, they, they sort of, um, parts of Jerusalem and parts of Aldere. And um, they also decided to paint the outside wall, the boundary wall, you know, the, the concrete um, retaining wall you'd seen. So they took to paint, it was a bit ugly. I had pointed that and I said, that doesn't look very nice. So I was very pleased that when I'd left, they'd actually taken that on board. So this is, um, you can see, recognize Jerusalem in there. This is, this is the local artist. And this is uh, what they've finished with. We, this is quite interesting. This is all spray painting because I had to deal with a chap who um, is a typical job. You know, you find them everywhere. This guy comes along with some spray and he's spraying it and I've got lighter as well. And he was about to set fire to the trees. And I was so angry and I was like shouting at him. Obviously, he doesn't understand English. I don't understand Arabic. And, um, you know, I, 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 I sort of... <laughs> and then I said, but you can't, you can't do this. You know, we've created this space. It's for you. You can't set fire to the trees. And so 
you know, to have spray paint to create this wall, to paint this, was, I think, a sort of interesting turnaround to use the same voice to sort of have a more positive impact it was good. Um, it sort of was in the local papers as well, sort of I became a little bit of a celebrity, so this is um, something, I don't know what it says, but uh, someone sort of translated briefly for me that it said that I have come from the UK and I'm doing amazing work in Palestine, <laughs> so this is a bit of the newspaper. And uh, this, this is something that was sent to me by the community, because they, they were very good at taking photos. Um, and um, so this is what we found, the same uh, part, and this is after clearing. And this is very interesting. You can see that boy on the sofa. And again, this, I didn't do this. The, you know, the community came, kind of changed the plan, which is great. You know, they took over. And they dragged the sofa um, from somewhere. And this has become study space. They didn't have study spaces. So it's become a study space for all of them. And they sit on the tree, or they, you know, play on the tree. And there, there's, there, there's Mohammed. Okay, so this is another project which has been done by the community after I returned. This has been only done last month. And this is a school where they were having problems with the playground. So again, you know, they haven't actually created anything, but they've tidied up, they've planted. So you can see before and after. These are pictures they've sent me. Um, this is some work they're doing on raising environmental awareness in Palestine. So these are the same volunteers. They're working in that school. This is their work. So this um, is a hospital that I spoke about earlier where I went there and uh, got involved in hospital design there, um, sort of consulting on a hospital in Jerusalem and in Gaza. <coughs> But this is what I mean with the plan there. So this is Palestine, this is Alvarez, the municipality, and that's the Israeli settlement. And in between here and here is what is called Category C land, which is sort of basically no man's land. So um, this is the problem with having um, these sort of political issues of, uh, of living in occupied space, because you, know, you can't do very much in, the, in this land. You can't plant trees. You know, uh, there's environmental problems because there's, you know, there is no tree cover, it's all coming down. And obviously, you know, it's not like Venezuela where you have, you know, plants growing up overnight. So, you know, uh, plants take a while to put roots into this very rocky soil. So you'll have one settlement like that. You go a kilometer or two, then you'll have another settlement on the hill. Um, so th this is the sort of so the plan is not you know, accurate in that sense, but this is the reality. Um, since coming back, we're starting a very big project in Hackney, uh, in London, and uh, this is called the Canal Side Project, and we're working with a group that deals specifically with art and film, filmmaking, and uh, another group that deals with mentoring and young people, and us, and so the three um, groups are working together and this will be an interesting project because it's the first time I'm working with older people as well and with uh, ex-offenders. Um, so I, I, I guess the dynamics will be very different. So you have very old people and you have ex-offenders. So, um, and this is, a pro uh, this is some work the community already have done. So they've started doing some work and we have been invited to continue uh, work on a large area of Metropolitan Housing Trust uh, in Hackney and Haggerston and this is starting next month. And this is a workshop I did in uh, Ladakh, which is sort of Western Tibet, and these are uh, refugee Tibetan children, and these were about 86 of them, and they're in this award-winning school, which is designed by Arab. And um, again, it, this was an, you know, every, every project we do, it's a different angle to it, and these kids are actually living in an environment which is not their own, in a culture that's not their own. So they're kind of being uprooted, not just physically, but spiritually and culturally as well, because they're actually in India. And um, so there's a sort of alienation from the environment they're in. So this building, which has got several environmental awards, 
the kids were actually throwing stones at the solar panels that destroyed them. And I asked, you know, I asked the kids why they were doing that. Back in London, of course, nobody knows, and this building is getting prizes and being written about in Architectural Magazine, but the reality is very different. So the, th the thing was, they, some of what they said, they, again, I had a, held a drawing workshop with them, and the ideas I discussed with them was that they felt there was no spirituality in the project, that they, they were living in this, um, in this school, this hostel, because the way um, this works is this, um, the school is closed for six months because it's completely snowbound. They can't travel to school. Um, so they, they live there for six months, and then they go back to their parents and stay for six months, and then they come back to school. That's how their school academic year works. So um, they found this sort of disharmony between how they were growing up at home and how... Uh, they were in this particular environment. They didn't understand what solar panels did. They just thought it was something they needed to throw stones at and find out what happened. So um, although the company was replacing it as fast as, you know, the kids were destroying it, I, I didn't think that was the solution. The solution was to sit down with them and actually explain, and there was no one there to do that. So I hope this uh, workshop actually helped them to connect with the environment. Okay, so that, that, that is it really. So, um, you know, I think in the end they've all been different, all the projects have been different, but again it kind of has reinforced, all the projects have reinforced to me the idea of building connections with people and with the environment they're in. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, so I hope that's given you all sorts of interesting ideas to ponder on as you go through these years of um, training to be architects or artists in other disciplines come to that. It's uh, as relevant to artists, I think, in any discipline as it is to architects. Um, so we'll have um, about a half hour break now. And then Samita's going to come do, down do, to do the... They want questions, so we've got 10 minutes. Is yeah. Time yeah, for question and answer now. Probably. Yeah, okay. we, can, we can definitely have some questions now. But um, well, when we finish here, we'll have a break of about half an hour, and then Samita's going to come down to the architecture studios. And this afternoon, we're going to do a participatory design exercise, which is going to be based on the design briefs that the second year are at the moment. But... We're using them just as an example of understanding who all the different stakeholders are in any design exercise and how they can all be involved in the process of design. So if we've got, got any questions you want to ask, speak now. Website or so how, how do I what? How, how have you promoted it so that people in these different countries know that you're working this way? Um, I don't know, it's just kind of spread really. I haven't done very much on promotion. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I mean, uh, I was invited to go to Palestine, for example, in 2008 or nine. I couldn't go because I didn't have childcare and they didn't want kids in there, my, two, my kids in there. So um, then the next year I was again invited and I couldn't go. And then, uh, but I, I kept the connections up, you know, I had their emails. And then in 2000, uh, 2011, I, I went there to give a talk about environmental issues and they said, would you like to come back and, and do a workshop? But between 2011 and 2013, there was this two years of toing and froing, and I, you know, finding money, which is a lot of my savings, going to, you know, these projects. So, um, you know, organizing that, getting different groups together, that just took two years. So, and Venezuela, how was it? Oh, Venezuela, I went there. I took my own students to Venezuela, and then I made connections, and they asked me to come back. So, and then some people 
I don't know how they, someone found me from Hackney. <laughs> so and they asked me to come and, and do this work. And so it's just, you know, I really, I mean, the website is there, but I haven't actually promoted it that much. Sorry? You've just got, got out there and done I've just got out, you know, who, whoever invites us. We don't, we don't uh, throw ourselves at people, so we just wait to be asked. So whoever invites us, we go and do some work. So I don't know, I mean, I think the Hackney project will keep us quite busy this year. So if someone does invite us, and, you know, if, and it takes a lot, lot of organising, so it's not just immediately, you know, you go there. So if something happens this year, I haven't planned for anything. If somebody does contact us, I'll go. It's obviously a very difficult problem with a, with a, a small charity that has almost no funds at all. Um, it's that kind of chicken and egg thing that you want more projects, obviously, um, but you don't have the resources to deal with them until you get more funds and more people involved and so on. So, and we haven't I got the capacity the to, to have too many volunteers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you know, it will, it will, it will come because we, we do very different work from, say, Architects uh, for Humanity or um, uh, Article 25. We're more into building communities and, you know, sustainability and long-term things rather than disaster management or one-off buildings. So, I mean, most of our work isn't even buildings, but it's about, you know, gardening or, you know, community spaces, that sort of thing. So, you know, there is a, there's a need for that because when I, I've traveled to many countries and I found that people are very good at uh, maintaining their own houses, even in slums when you go, if you look at the ha individual houses there, you know, people have, take time to decorate their houses and maintain them. But the communal spaces, <coughs> That's like a no man's land. And that's the area we want to impact. And the thing is, it has an inverse relationship. So when we do something in a community space, we find that it makes the people want to improve their houses even, better, you know, even more. And then they want to do something more for the, so it's like a to and fro thing. So um, hopefully, you know. But this one really concerns me because um, these kids are forced or placed in a situation which is not of their own. And, um, you know, uh, I've been kind of thinking about how to help them. So, you know, they're often like, I think about things and then something, you know, somebody calls me and, you know, it's one of those telepathic things that happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just had a, a question just in relation to the project you did in Venezuela. Um, you mentioned that there'd been some storm clearance uh, on that area. Uh, what happens to the people who live in those slums? Where are they moved to? Are, are they moved to? Is it just kind of a... Well, the idea was that the new um, uh, the Metro Cable station they built, they would have houses on the top. Um, so the, the, house, the people whose houses were demolished uh, were told that you'd get new houses or flats there. But that's not what happened. <laughs> because when the um, people uh, finished the... Uh, they, they built the station, they found they had no money left to build on top of that, so that was just the station. So then um, they found, they built some really ugly prefab housing, which is right next to the site. And this is like 14 floors with no lifts. And, you know, people going up and down. And, and they said it was better we lived in those shacks than live in these sort of modern concrete blocks because you know, older people are finding it very difficult going up and down. Um, so they were given these sort of horrible places to live in. I'm just interested to see what organisations and funding bits you put together when you're gathering funding for these projects. Well, well, sorry, could you repeat that, please? When, when do you source the funding for these projects? My savings. So you don't want to give any funding bits or apply for any? We just, uh, I don't have the time to apply for funding. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a full-time job, you know, to be a fundraiser, to fill those forms and, you know, keep filling forms to tell them that you're using the money correctly. It's, it's, it's another waste of money. I tried something called crowd crowdfunding, 
And that seemed to be a huge uh, waste of money as well, because the people who actually donated to that uh, project were uh, people I knew already. And all that happened was that um, uh, something like I, I raised about 250 pounds, and uh, I think something like 30 or 40 pounds was taken in fees by the crowdfunding company. So I lost that, the 40 pounds that would have gone directly into the project. And one of the things, so um, someone in the end suggested, why didn't you just write to your friends and ask them to give the money to you directly? But I just wanted to try it out to see what happens because I thought, you know, maybe people who don't know about the work we're doing, they might donate, but it, did, you know, it didn't happen like that. So that was an interesting exercise. And, um, but people who donated money um, uh, with the, we did, um, I think you were there when we did that pub quiz thing, yeah. yeah. We did a pub quiz thing, which uh, again was like a tremendous effort for, <laughs> you know, we raised 330 pounds for that. Uh, but, it, you know, people were very, it was a great fun night and we did a little auction and, you know, it was just wonderful. It was a wonderful <coughs> evening. But I just thought I can't bear to do this again <laughs> because there's so much organizing involved in it. So I just, if I, if, I, you know, if I do a lecture, for example, and I get a bit of money, I put it aside and I just do it that way. If somebody gives me money, I'm very happy to accept it. Uh, but, um, you know, like the Hackney project, we've got some money from the Metropolitan Housing Trust. But I, I just can't spend my time writing those forms and I haven't got time for that, you know. And the, the people, well, somebody made a very interesting comment. They said, we really like the way you work because when we donate to Oxfam or the other bigger charities, we don't know what's happening to the money, whether it's going to someone's pocket or whether you know it's being really used for, for doing any useful work. But with your projects, we can very clearly see that you know you I go there, I do the work, and I come back. It's very transparent. You know, you see what's been built, so there is no middle middle person. There, so all our expenses, everything is just out there. So I'm very grateful for any kind of donation, any voluntary work. If it comes, if it doesn't come, I'll still do it anyway. Yeah, I mean fundraising is a big, a big problem. It's a big issue. Uh, I mean, I've been involved in fundraising before, and I mean the, the charities usually work on the basis that. You know, for every thousand pounds that you raise, it costs you a hundred pounds to raise that. Uh, and obviously, when you're starting up, you haven't got that money to put into the fundraising, so you can't raise the funds. And every time you raise the funds, you've got to raise 110 percent of what you want in order to pay for the next lot of fundraising. Which, you know, when you look at it that way, it seems to be a, a bit of a nonsense. But, um, if you, if you can't, if you can't, you like the, the larger corporate charities like Oxfam, like you say, you know, are, are spending that money on projects which might not have as much weight as, as this. And it seems a shame that this has to come out of your own pocket. And that's happened. And, you know, there are plenty of bits in well, I do claim tax relief for that. So that way it's not going to the in on revenue is going to the yeah. people that need it. So that's the only, only good thing about it. But yes, I'd like to have the savings there. But... You know, you can go and spend your money in Primark or something, you know, <laughs> on designer shoes. This is how I spend, choose to spend my money. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, everybody's welcome to come down to the architecture studios in half an hour's time and take part in the design workshop. It will be very interesting to that. Um, but until then, thank you very much. See you tomorrow.